know when she'll tell me to turn it off. It's not super hot in here, but it's not the greatest. So welcome everybody. Um, I think I know recognize a couple of names on the list here. So nice to see or see your presence. And the bummer about this talk for than anybody who's had a talk by me is that it's usually very audience interactive, but we're not going to be able to do that this time, which will A, mean I can't pick on anybody, and B, means it'll probably go quicker and you won't get picked on. So we'll see how that all works. So yes, this is a talk about dragons and dams of, of New Hampshire, and if you thought it was about insects, um, you're right, but this is just a fun slide that I put there to um, confuse people at the beginning. So yeah, so this, this talk is divided into um, three broad parts, one about the basic biology of dragonflies, and one about the diversity of dragonflies, and one about sort of um, the dragonflies of New Hampshire and what we know about them and have learned in recent years. Um, so this picture here is usually a cue to the audience, and I try to get people to describe a dragonfly in two words. And you guys, as I said, are off the hook. Those two words are flying eyes. Um, there's really two impressive things about dragonflies. One is that they've got some pretty amazing eyes. They can basically three, see 360 degrees around them with a tiny gap in the back. And they're also really incredible flyers with these four big wings that you see on them. We'll talk more about those bits as we go. They also have legs and mouths and all those other parts, but really the things that sort of stand out on them are they basically, they're very visual and they're very, very good at flying around. Um, they're in, in the insect order, Odonata, um, which is from Latin for toothed ones. They've got very complex chewing, biting mouth parts, um, which, you know, if you ever catch one, you can have a bite you and you'll, you'll feel a little chewingness. And you'll often hear me say odes or odinates as the shorthand colloquialism for these guys. They have been around a very long, whoops, very long time. Um, they are basically, them and mayflies are the essentially the first groups of insects that actually flew, um, which is very shortly after insects came onto land. And there are fossil dragonflies dating back over 300 million years. Um, they sometimes had two foot wingspans. So imagine the dragonfly the size of, you know, a sharp shinned hawk or a cooper's hawk flying around, taking out your small children, cats, you name it. Um, probably not because there were no small children or cats then, but they were big. Sometimes they had six wings, the primitivist ones. This particular fossil is from the Jurassic, so it's only about 150 million years ago, and it was probably only like a foot in diameter. But they, they were really big back then because there was more oxygen in the, in the atmosphere. Insects were very large, and they've sort of shrunk down now to things that are very more, rarely more than like four or five inches in wingspan. Um, Everybody, when they took biology in high school, probably learned that there were insects have three body regions. Um, the first is the head, and in most insects, especially dragonflies, this is the sensory end of things. They've got, as I said, really, really big eyes. You can see that little tiny antenna sticking out in front of the eye there. That's as good as they get. Um, if you see artwork or depictions of any kind with dragonflies with big curly antenna like a butterfly. Those are blatantly wrong. You should not buy them. If you own them, you should either scrape off those antenna or throw them in the trash. You know, if you don't have dragonflies, they don't have antenna. Antenna are usually chemical sensing and dragonflies have almost no sense of smell essentially in that regard. The head is also where the mouth parts are. You can kind of see them there below the eye. It's almost like a little black smile. Um, that they used to, to basically chew up their lunch. In the middle is the thorax, which is the locomotion part of the body. There are, in dragonflies and damselflies, there are two pairs of wings and three pairs of legs. All insects have three pairs of egg legs. And going through this are obviously the organs, the, the heart as it is, is in there, and parts of the digestive system. And finally, the abdomen, we'll sometimes call it the tail which is not really the case, because um, it contains a whole bunch of organs, um, including all the reproductive organs, which we'll talk about in a bit, and the endpoint of the digestive system. 
And one of the main questions I always get is what's the difference between a dragonfly and a damselfly? Some people think it's got to do with sex. The damselflies are female, dragonflies are males. That is not the case. It is, there are two very broad groups based on several structural features. Um, here we have a dragonfly on the right. Dragonflies tend to hold, I mean, dragonfly on the left, my, my bad, a little dyslexia, dyslexia there. Dragonfly on the left, they hold their wings out to the side in most cases. Their wings are different shapes. The front wing and the hind wing are different shapes. You can see the hind wing is much broader and the front wing has a much narrower base in this guy. And also they tend to be much more robust. They've got a thicker abdomen, they've got a sturdier thorax. They might not be very big. This dragonfly is actually smaller than the damselfly on the right in total length and wingspan but it's bulkier. They tend to be very chunky compared to damselflies. On the right is actually one of the largest dragonflies on the planet. It's a damselfly from Costa Rica again. This has a six or seven inch wingspan. And most damselflies hold their wings folded up over their back like this. And also all four wings are the same shape. And you can see that here because all four wings are lined up against each other and looks like just they're all the same shape. And finally, they have much more slender body types, including the very long slender abdomen. So folded, equal sized wings, skinny abdomens for damsels, um, spread wings, different size, different shapes, and stocky are dragonflies. There'll be a couple of exceptions we'll see as we go through this, but that's the big difference. Um, that's always good to remember so you can identify what you're talking about. Now, probably one of the coolest things about um, Odinate's life cycles is, well, one of the coolest things about them is their life cycle. These are basically aquatic organisms. Most of their lives are spent in the water. Some species, it may be four or five years that they spend in the water as a larva. Sometimes they're called nymphs, the same thing. And then they'll hatch out and be a flying adult for maybe a couple of months at the most. So we're gonna actually start with the water um, briefly. So this dragonfly here is a male um, flying around. Most dragonflies and most damselflies, a lot of damselflies, are territorial like birds. The males will have a little section of wetland or stream stretch section that they fly back and forth along, defending against other males, attracting females. When the female shows up, um, the male will basically try to catch her. And you get, you may have seen this particular um, situation um, where we've got a male damselfly on the right, female on the left. And the male has caught the female and he grabs her behind her head with a pair of clasping structures at the end of his abdomen called circe. In most damselflies, the shape of the male circe matches depressions on the female's neck. So they actually they line up and they can identify the right species that way. And dragonflies, they're not that specialized. They just grab things. They'll often grab their own species. They may even grab other males if they're desperate enough. And this is what's called a tandem position. You know, I always make a joke here about the insect Kama Sutra. There's a couple of cool sexual positions that you can try at home. Um, and the tricky part about this is that the male sperm are produced at the base of the abdomen, near where the wings are attached. And but he's, um, Actually, wait, I got it backwards, my bad. They're produced at the end of the abdomen. I just gave away the answer. But when he's grabbing the female, he actually, in the sheet, they need to go to the end of her abdomen. So basically, in insects, um, fertilization occurs when the two abdomen tips touch each other. In the case of dragonflies, the male's grabbing the female with that structure, and if he lets go, she's just gonna fly away. Another male may come in and, and grab her instead, and he kind of loses his opportunity there. So what the male will have done before doing this or during this is transfer sperm from the end of his abdomen to the base of the abdomen. And that first segment you see there is kind of paler looking in this picture. There's a whole bunch of little secondary structures called secondary genitalia. Sex education of dragonflies and, yeah. and oh. uh, Sorry, somebody want, talking I'll turn it on. <laughs> um, you, they actually transfer the sperm to that structure, and then you'll see what happens next. So this is basically, um, I'm gonna do something funky here for a second. Um, so basically, people can see this, the sperm are produced here in that little red thing, and they get put down here. 
So he actually curves his abdomen all the way around to make that connection. And then the sperm are stored here. And then you get the next stage. Hold on there. Sometimes zoom is weird, which is this. This is called the wheel position, where the female, now the brown one, has curled her abdomen around so that the end of it meets up with where the male put his sperm. And then fertilization can occur. So they have to catch her, they have to transfer their sperm, and then the female can curl around and pick the sperm up like this. And everybody lives happily ever after. But there's one final trick to this game, and as part of those secondary structures at the base of the male's abdomen, they have little scooping structures called hamules. And what those structures do is that they can actually, while this fertilization thing is happening, they can go in there and remove sperm that might have been put there by a previous female, I mean a previous male. So if you know, male A mates with this female, then she escapes from him before she lays her eggs. This male B catches her, he can take out male A's sperm and replace it with his own. Some really crazy things that insects do to make sure they're the ones that, that have the kids. So once that fertilization happens, the female will lay her eggs. There are two ways of doing this. All the damselflies and then the darners, the big dragonflies like this one, you can see it in this picture. I'll do the little drawing thing again because that's kind of cool. Have a little blade-like spike thing down here called an ovipositor, which actually is a little knife. It inserts itself into a plant and lays eggs within the plant tissues. This doesn't hurt the plant too much. It might leave a little scar, um, but it makes it a safe place for the eggs to get laid. Um, everybody else lays eggs by like, doing like a sewing machine and dipping them in the water one or a few at a time. You may have seen dragonflies doing that, but they kind of just hover over the water and go up and down with their abdomens touching the water. In either case, they lay a whole bunch of eggs, depending on the species and how old they are, maybe uh, you know, 50 to 150 eggs get laid per time. A female can go back after she lays eggs, make more eggs over a course of a week or so and come back and lay some more. She can do that three or four times, as long as she stays alive. And those eggs, which are really tiny, the size of poppy seeds or so, will hatch out within just a couple of days into these little teensy, 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 what are called prolarva, almost microscopic baby dragonflies that then go through several stages where they eat, they grow, they shed their skin, and get bigger and bigger. And eventually, let's close that thing again. Um, you may have seen, especially if you've ever just spent time dipping nets in the pond water, they get to these fairly large larvae, um, which basically look like, you know, they don't look like dragonflies at all. They're long and skinny, long spindly legs. This one shows very well. I'll do this again because it's been working well. well. These wing buds right on the back. As they get bigger, those get bigger. So the early instar larvae have no wing buds. And this one, because these are very large, is actually about to hatch out and become a, a flying dragonfly. And the reason, the only reason I found it was because it was climbing around near the surface of the water. If they're underwater, not ready to emerge, you're, you're not going to see them very easily. So eventually, once those dragonflies are, those larvae are ready to mature, and again, it could be a matter of a year for most species, from when the eggs are laid to when they hatch out and start flying, to four or five years of some of the larger species that live in colder climates or, or things like rivers where there's limited food, um, that lifespan can be quite long. And then they will climb out of the water. Um, you'll see them on bridges, you'll see them on docks, you'll see them on rocks. Um, and they climb out, they kind of, kind of get themselves ready, they will split the back of their exoskeleton and the emerging dragonfly will be like a snake shedding its skin, the dragonfly will pop out of that exoskeleton and then they'll leave it behind. And here we see in a fully, fully emerged dragonfly, his wings haven't opened up yet, sitting on top of that leftover um, skin, which is called an exuvia. And you can actually collect those from stream banks and identify them as species, other fun things. This whole process, um, oops, I forgot that slide. So these are a couple of exuvia. You can see them along streams, two different species, a big one and a small one. It's one of my favorite things to do 
if I'm kayaking on the river is looking for these and collecting them and seeing what species are around. That whole process from climbing out to, to flying away will probably take between half an hour and an hour, depending on what species you're talking about, how big it is. And this little sequence I'm going to show you here is a time lapse of multiple pictures taken over about 20 minutes of one of the smaller species that I found um, the larva on the bank. I took it off, put it on my net, so I could just, I was in a kayak, so I had to just keep it in one spot. And you can already see here, do this again, there's some fur right there on the back. The thing is already split open the back. So that's probably one of the longest things to wait for. If you see a dragonfly larva out of the water, I highly encourage you to watch it. You know, unless you're like giving birth or bleeding to death, you've got half an hour to an hour to see this really cool thing happen. And, you know, it's worth doing it. So it takes a long time for this first crack to appear and have the little fuzz show up because that's like they actually have to break that shell. Um, once that happens, everything's happening a little faster. You can also see right here, this little white line. That little white line is actually the connection between the aquatic gills of the larva and the terrestrial spiracles, the air breathing apparatus of the adult. And they're kind of connected inside and then they basically come apart and snap apart. And it's kind of cool to watch that happen. Um, so as we watch this critter pop out, you'll see that stretch out, you'll see the animal appear out of the thing. So just sit back and enjoy the show, and then I'll do it again with some commentary. So again, that look, that took 20 minutes. This is a small species. So there's a few things to notice as you watch this the second time because it's cool enough to watch the second time. So the critter's already cracked the shell and starting to pop his back out. Very shortly, the whole head pops out through the head. There's the, there's the eyes. The legs will come out next. And then it sits like this for a while to sort of get itself hardened up enough so those legs can actually support itself. And then after a little while, it's going to lunge forward, grab the substrate, and pull the abdomen out very quickly. And then it's going to pump blood into the wings and into the abdomen to expand them out to the final length, and then sort of sit there for a while. While those kind of get sorted out, it'll retract the blood back into the wings. The wings, actually, those veins in the wings are structural. They don't really, aren't really circulatory. And then it'll sit like that for a little while. Eventually, it'll open those wings up and fly away, if it's lucky. Um, this is an example of one that just went through that whole process. You can see the wings are very, very shiny. They haven't fully hardened up yet. And you can see that the front right wing is, doesn't look too good. Um, these wings are basically like saran wrap. You can, you know, everybody's played with saran wrap. If it gets caught on something or on itself, it becomes a pain in the butt to, fix it all up. If, if a dragonfly's expanding wing gets caught on a branch or hooked on a rock or a drop of water falls on it, it can totally basically destroy that wing. It basically makes it, keeps it from inflating. And this dragonfly could not fly. Um, you know, that wing is non-functional and it, they can't really fly with only three wings. They can fly with a broken wing if the tip breaks off, but if the wing is completely shriveled up like a little club foot thing, um, they can't fly. So that dragonfly is not going anywhere. Um, this, this is what's called a tenoral dragonfly. They, when they first come out of this shell, they're very soft, they're very vulnerable, they're very tasty to birds and squirrels and everything else. And the first thing they're going to do is fly up into the woods, feed, and harden up and be ready to come back to the water and start the whole thing over again. And so this is an adult male dragonfly back at a pond, all mature, all fancy looking and ready to chase other males off and get a female and start that whole thing over again. So that's the life cycle. Again, it, can, it may take 
a year for most species, up to five. There's one species we'll talk about later that that whole life cycle takes only a couple of months from egg to adult, but there's the special case. So really they're aquatic organisms that have a flying sexual stage. A bit more basic biology. Um, what do they eat? Um, the short answer is anything smaller than they are. This is a female damselfly eating a different species of female damselfly. She's already eaten the head. Um, the head's the tasty parts where the brains are, so it's all sorts of yummies in there. But she will basically have eaten this other damselfly like a popsicle. She'll just work her way down until it's totally gone, and she'll eat it in one sitting. And probably that'd be enough to keep her going for a while. She'll go off, make some eggs, and come back and do some more things. Um, but their main prey are other insects, smaller flying insects. The damselflies kind of glean them. They, they fly around in the vegetation and find other insects that are sitting on plants and grab them and then perch and eat them. Um, in the water, um, they'll eat other small things in the water. So they'll eat other dragonfly of nymphs. They'll eat other aquatic insects like tadpoles, small fish. The, the, the larvae have a really cool um, extendable jaw, almost like the monster in the movie Alien, where it's folded back underneath their head and it's actually twice as long as their head. And they can shoot that thing out and it's got pinchers at the end, shoot it out, grab the prey from fairly far away and bring it back and then eat it. Um, dragonflies are primarily aerial predators. This guy has caught a the tiger swallowtail, again, almost as big as it is, and they'll catch things in flight, and if they're big enough, they'll land and eat them, but if they're small enough, they'll just eat them while they're flying. They, they use their legs as like a net. They've got little spines on the legs that can catch insects in flight, and then if it's small enough, they'll just reach up and put it in their mouth while they're flying. So, you know, so what do they eat? Anything smaller than them that flies, and they sometimes have eyes that are bigger than their stomachs. Um, I did not take this picture, but there are multiple examples of these large dragonflies. This one here is called a dragon hunter, the same one as the last picture. It's one of our largest dragonflies, and they are, have been recorded on many cases catching hummingbirds. I'm not sure they can eat a hummingbird. I'm not sure they could even kill a hummingbird, um, but they're apparently strong and fast and tough enough to take the hummingbird down, which is just really, really impressive that these things can do that. Um, so even hummingbirds are not immune to the um, perils of these monstrous aerial predators. But of course, they're not the top of the food chain most of the time because this one's eating a bird, this one's bird, this one bird is eating a dragonfly. And in fact, that greenish dragonfly down there is a dragon hunter, like the last picture. It's one of those freshly emerged shiny green tendrils. It's very soft. We were watching that dragonfly emerge, and as soon as it flew, this catbird dove out of a bush like 10 feet away, grabbed it, and beat it to death on a rock and took it back to feed its young. So what eats them is lots and lots of birds, lots of other dragonflies. Um, chipmunks and other rodents will walk around the edges of streams and ponds picking off the emerging adults. In Southeast Asia, um, dragonfly larvae are, are, you know, eaten by people. It's like sometimes people eat crickets and things. This is a fun picture of a praying mantis in the middle there, um, having caught a pair of darners that were mating. On the right hand side is the male with the blue abdomen. He's got it, the mantis has it in one claw. The other claw is the female dragonfly behind her head. So these these two dragonflies were probably mating. They were probably looking for a place to lay eggs. And the mantis saw, look at this, I can get two for the price of one, and reached out and somehow managed to get both of them. The problem was, of course, that their dragonfly in the front, the male, was still flying. So the whole thing was unbalanced. It eventually broke free, which made the thing even more unbalanced. And the mantis let go of both of them, and it didn't get anybody to eat there. But uh, you know, that was a pretty cool thing to find. And of course, a really unexpected thing that eats dragonflies like the occasional plant. Here's a sundew eating one of these very small female damselflies like we saw earlier on. It probably doesn't happen very often, but uh, obviously it can happen. Now we'll shift into a bit of habitat stuff. So yeah, obviously all dragonflies and damselflies are 
aquatic organisms. They need water. Most of them need fresh water. We'll get to the exception at the very end of this segment. Um, this particular freshwater pond is a retention pond about half a mile from my house. It's full of trash and probably all sorts of runoff from the roads. Not the most pristine place on the planet. But when I was surveying here 10, 15 years ago on a regular basis, I documented 46 species of dragonflies and downflies from this pond. So just because it's a crappy retention pond doesn't mean it's not good habitat for some species. But you know, better habitats are things like this nice beaver pond, natural habitats can have very high diversity of dragons and damsels. Beaver ponds are classic, any sort of natural wetland like that. There are species that instead of living in, in stable and um, non-flowing water, live in rivers and streams. Um, this isn't too far from you guys. This is the um, Bear Camp River in West Ossipee. Um, depending on the type of stream, it has different species. Some of them like shady streams with sand, some of them like big rivers. I mean, whoops, <laughs> it's not a big river at all. Some of them like um, small rocky streams, some of them like big rivers. Here's the Saco, which is more sand. So sand, rock, um, mud, depending on the habitat, we'll have different species in the stream. There's also um, a bunch of species that like bogs. Um, you know, some of these are very cool northern species because bogs tend to have northern plants. They're kind of a relic of the glaciers. Um, so there's often some very interesting species that occur in bogs. And last but not least, there is one species in the entire planet, and we have it right here in New Hampshire, that lives in salt marsh. It's called the seaside dragonlet. I think I should put a picture of it on this slide, actually. I'll do a little animation thing for a future version of this. And it's the only saltwater dragonfly in the world, and which is kind of cool because, you know, saltwater is a very different environment in terms of aquatic animals, in terms of your adjustment to salt and tides and temperature. All sorts of crazy things happen in salt marshes that don't happen in freshwater plant ones. But this one species has adapted to that and thrives. So very, very common sometimes in those habitats. So this is actually when I might take a little break if there's been any questions popping up now about the basic life cycle and biology of dragonflies. I think I could take them if anybody's asked anything or wants to ask one. Sometimes it's better when it's fresh in your mind. Um, right now, Pam, none have cropped, have uh, popped up in the chat box. I don't know if anyone, um, if anyone has one, they can, they can either manually unmute themselves or type it in uh into the chat box real quick otherwise we'll if not we'll keep on going there you go. i've explained it perfectly <laughs> five four if the, if yes the dragonfly is, is uh one of the multi-year larval stage does the size of the larva change over the years yes the, the size of the larva changes no matter what it just takes longer to grow in those longer year ones because it's usually because it's less food great thank you you're very welcome. Um, Pam, there was also a follow-up, uh, two follow-up questions in the chat box. So can you repeat the name of the salt marsh dragonfly? Yep, the seaside dragonlet. Seaside dragonlet, okay. And um, do they, so do they hunt in packs? There's a question that came through on that, or are they solitary? Um, they're basically solitary yet. Yeah, this is a question I usually get, so I'm glad someone came up with it, and I usually forget to mention it. People often see swarms of dragonflies, especially in late summer, usually really big ones, flying out over their yards at dusk. Um, those are opportunistic hunting sw swarms because there's a concentration of insects, usually like an emergence of flying ants or tiny midges. Um, so they all gather in one spot simply because there's a ton of food there rather than coordinating anything amongst themselves. Excellent question because I always forget to talk about that. Okay, and there is one other one other question and that is, I guess, uh, clarifying that water bug, this, they're asking water bugs are not dragonfly larvae. Right, well, it depends on what you want to call bugs, but yeah, the, the yeah. things that we usually think about with water bugs that are like usually kind of leaf shaped and things like that, those are a completely different group of insects. All right, but, they're just gonna, the question. <laughs> yeah, okay, we're gonna, yeah, otherwise they keep We'll take going. this, we have one more and then we'll. we'll one more. All right, right, and so that is, how do the nymph's eyesight differ from adults? 
I honestly don't know. That's an excellent question. Um, it's probably very similar, but way less complicated because there was, those eyes are not as complex as the adult eyes. A lot of the, a lot of the larvae are, um, they're much more stocky. Like they, they're, they're, they see something moving and they sneak up on it and then catch it. So I think their eyes are probably a little less sophisticated than the adults. That's a cool question. I should look that up and see if we know anything about it. All right, fabulous. Thanks for that. Excellent. Good questions, everybody. So now we're going to take a little break to show you a whole bunch of pretty pictures and this talk about the diversity of dragonflies in New Hampshire. There are um, nine families, three families of damsels and six of dragons. And we're going to talk about all of these to a greater or lesser extent. Some of them are very potentially, you know, I guess, boring is the wrong word because they're all very cool insects, but there's less stories about them. And we'll start with the broad winged damsels. Um, people may have seen this species. This is called the ebony jewel wing. And one thing I like to mention is that the names, the common names for these guys are only about 25 years old now. Um, a committee of the Dragonfly Society of the Americas got together, probably had a bunch of beer, and came up with some really awesome names for most of these species before which it was just the scientific names. The broadwing damsels tend to be very beautifully metallic green or red like this guy is. They tend to have pigment in the wings and they're all stream species. Um, these guys, the ebony jewel wing is found mainly on smaller shaded streams um, and some of his relatives on larger streams. This is a very common species you might see out exploring the streams of, of anywhere in the state actually. The wings is one of the exception that proves the rule. This is a damselfly. The wings are all the same shape. It's very slender, but they hold their wings partially open like this. Um, the cool thing about these species is A, they all look about the same. So they're, you know, the only way to tell them apart is looking at the male sexual organs. Um, but the real cool thing about them is that they actually lay their eggs in the fall, most of them, those eggs overwinter in the in the ponds or in the vernal pool type situation. And then in the spring they hatch and develop really quickly over the summer to hatch out again around this time of year. These guys come out later than most. So they actually overwinter as eggs, whereas most species, the eggs hatch very quickly within a few days and start the whole thing off. And they all have that, those cool blueberry looking eyes. These guys, the pond damsels, are probably my favorite group of odonates. So I might go on and on and on and on about them. In fact, I probably will. Um, most of them are like this. They're very, they're small blue with black markings. You've probably seen them on the lily pads. The fun part is that there are about 20 species of these, just this one genus, Analagma, the bluets in New Hampshire. There's a whole bunch of different species of this group. Um, and a whole bunch of them are blue. There's this one, and there's this one, and they're very similar looking. And in fact, the only way to tell them apart is to look at the very tip of the male's abdomen where those little circe are, they grab the female, usually with the hand lens or even a microscope to tell them apart. So this is a hand lens view of one species to look at those structures and that's how you tell them apart. So the bluets can be quite tricky. Some of them are identical except for those structures. But the good news is there's also some bluets that aren't blue. <laughs> this is the very well-named scarlet bluet, which is quite common in New Hampshire. And I'm going to talk more about that one in a bit because it's actually a very cool story with this insect. So there's a whole bunch of these pond damsels. They're all very skinny. They're usually very brightly colored, blue, some purple ones, a yellow one, an orange one, some greenish ones. Um, all very small, all about an inch and a quarter or less long. Shifting to the dragons, we have the darners. Um, if you're going to learn a couple of species from this talk, the ebony jewel wing is one. The common green darner is another. These are very large, bright green um, thorax, and a, the males have a bright blue abdomen. That's the pair we saw getting eaten or tried being eaten by the mantis earlier. The cool thing about these guys is that some of them are migratory. So in this case, some of the, the adults will live longer than most other species. If you see a green darner in, in like May, or early June, it means it migrated north from somewhere south here, possibly as far as Florida. Um, they will lay their eggs, they will then die. It's kind of like the monarch in this regard. Those eggs will develop very quickly over the summer into adults again. They usually live in very 
food rich places like beaver ponds and other very food, you know, very warm algae filled ponds. And then those larvae will hatch out and they will fly south again and then reproduce again farther south. So almost like the monarch, but maybe a little bit backwards because the monarch breezes goes north. These guys probably do it as they go south. And people have put radio transmitters on these things and detected them flying across Delaware Bay from Cape May, New Jersey. And, you know, we know that they can fly as far as like from the Great Lakes to the Yucatan Peninsula. So literally, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 miles that a single adult green darner can fly during its migration. And we're still trying to fathom some of the stories that they do when they're not up here in terms of what happens over the winter with reproduction and so forth. The club tails are a group of primarily river species. They're named because the abdomen tends to be expanded at the end, kind of like a little bowling pin or a club. They're very, very beautiful. They often have this black with green and yellow markings. Some of them are all very, very beautiful. Um, they're sort of hard to catch. And so they're very popular with dragonfly enthusiasts because A, some of them are just hard to catch. So there's a challenge there. And of course, they're also very beautiful. Um, and amongst them is possibly my other most favorite odonate, which we saw before, the dragon hunter. Um, it's, it's four inches, three and a half inches long, very, very large, eats everything under, they can catch, and basically goes up and down the streams. And I always refer to them as something like an Apache helicopter flying back and forth, just waiting for something to, to, to take out. So if you see a really giant looking black and yellow dragonfly with giant green eyes flying along the stream, it's probably a dragon hunter and you should hide your small children. These, these two groups, um, very small groups, the spike tails is only the four species in New Hampshire and the cruisers is only two. They look very similar to the club tails. They're black or brown with yellow markings and green eyes. They're both stream species. Um, in many ways, they're not a lot more different than the club tail, so we're just going to skip over them. Another very large group are the emeralds, so named because their eyes in particular are often very amazingly emerald green, metallic green. Otherwise, they're usually very poorly marked, you know, sort of metallic greenish bronze bodies. You see some little spots on the abdomen here, um, nothing too fancy. Um, there's a couple of cool ones here. One of the great stories is this one. As you might tell, this picture was taken in the dark. There are a single genus of, of emeralds called shadow dragons that are crepuscular. They come out at dusk, fly around for 20 minutes to half an hour eating, and then disappear and hide during the day in trees. Um, so that's pretty cool. To catch them, you have to be out at dusk in the water with a net. So try catching an insect in the near darkness while you're standing up to your waist in the river. And it's a quite, quite a fun challenge, but it's often rewarding. And this bug here, as what I think is one of the best names for any animal ever on the planet. It's called the Stygian shadow dragon. And Stygian, in this case, comes from the river Styx of Greek mythology, the river in the underworld. So it's a river species in the dark. And so it's got, the, it got a great name that those guys came up for it back in the late mid 1990s. Okay, the final group, the skimmers. These are your charismatic, colorful, very obvious dragonflies that you see are all over the place in the summer. The cool thing about them is they're often very brightly marked and also they're often sexually dimorphic. This is a critter called the common white tail. The males have these black patches in the wings and the bright white abdomen almost glow in the dark. The female has a different wing pattern and a very, very cryptic abdomen. And in most cases, the females are more cryptic than the males. It's probably to make them safer while they're hiding in the woods, maturing and being ready to lay eggs. They're less likely to get eaten by a bird or something then, whereas the males are a little more expendable. Same thing here. This is another pair, the, the bright blue male eastern pond hawk and the very cryptic green female eastern pond hawk. A very common group of, of skimmers are the meadow hawks, these little red dragonflies that are just starting to show up now. They'll be, they'll be common um, through August and September into early October, depending on how far north you are. There's about five species of them. They're very tricky to tell apart, but uh, they're very common. You can impress your friends. Look, a meadow hawk. And this is a good picture to comment on something that I always forget to talk about earlier. You see those red 
little spots in each wing. Um, all dragonflies and downflies have these, they're different colors. They're a pigmented cell in the wing called the pseudostigmata. And that little extra pigment um, probably makes them a little heavier and that allows the insect to sort of know where the end of its wing is. There's sort of a little bit of a tactile sensory structure that allows a dragonfly to kind of feel the end of its wing, kind of like a cat's whiskers or something like that. This is the smallest dragonfly in New Hampshire. It's called the Elfin Skimmer. It's an adorable little guy. It's like a little wind-up toy or something um, that's found in bogs all over the state. You know, and that's my finger there. So that's, it's, you know, the, it's as long as my thumb is wide, which is a pretty tiny little insect. And the final cool story in the skimmers is this guy. This is called the wandering glider. The, in Europe, it's called the globe skimmer. And it's called those names because this is actually a dragonfly that occurs everywhere on the planet except Antarctica and the Arctic. It has been documented in Hawaii. It will cross the Pacific Ocean at least halfway from one side to the other and stop in Hawaii or Polynesia somewhere and continue on. Um, it is a species that can mature from an egg to a flying adult in six weeks. So it's, it's adapted to lay eggs in ephemeral wetlands, like after thunderstorms, and then those larvae develop really rapidly, eating mosquitoes, hatch out, and the adults migrate somewhere else. There's actually a TED talk about this species migration, where it, you know, the guy figured out how it follows the monsoon winds and helped push it across the Indian Ocean from India to Africa, and then works its way up back through Africa and the Middle East to get back to India over multiple generations. So it's a really fascinating critter. The, the wandering glider is a, a truly globe-trotting dragonfly. Okay. So that was a quick overview of diversity. I won't do some questions now because we don't have a huge amount of time. can save that for a bit. Um, but the other thing that's really fun is talking about more specifically what the dragonfly situation in New Hampshire is. And from 2000, okay, hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. Oh yeah, no, from 2007 to 11, Audubon and Fishing Game did a project called the New Hampshire Dragonfly Survey. Um, and this is our logo. This is a dragon hunter again. And the joke always was that this is to scale. So if you see a dragonfly that's about the size of New Hampshire, run for the hills. Um, this was an effort um, to update our knowledge of these guys in the state. This little document here um, was produced in 1973 by some guys at UNH. They documented, based on their research and digging through old records, 134 species known for New Hampshire. As of a couple of years ago, that number is now, whoops, I used to quiz people, 165 or 166, which is, you know, we've found a bunch, some of which were just missing before, some which have actually expanded into the state in that time frame. And some of the reason for that is because dragonflies have gotten much more popular only in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. There were no field guides for them until recently. You have to rely on these giant manuals that were all dichotomous keys without any color pictures of, looking at genitalia and wing venation. But then people started making field guides. People started getting interested in it. You know, these four people, none of them is an entomologist, and they're all actually very important people. I can't remember the guy on the right with the bandana, but everybody else has made major contributions to what we know about dragonflies in Massachusetts or New York or various places. And they're birders, the one's an engineer, one's a French teacher. So let's like birding. Once we had resources identified these things, people got into it and learned a lot of stuff. And there's some really great ways of doing this with maps. So this is just the number of species per county in New Hampshire in 1973 versus 2006 when we started this project. And you can see a huge change everywhere except down in the southeast there in um, Stratford County. And that's of course because that's where UNH is. So for decades, UNH students have been collecting dragonflies. They're all in the collections there. So we had a lot of data for there. But think about poor Sullivan County over there to 16. Nobody was looking there, and it's since got a lot better. So once we started people looking, um, we found a whole lot more stuff. It's even more telling when you look at the town level. So you can all try to find your town there. We'll get back to this again. The main point of this story is there's Durham down there in purple in the southeast. And the other hotspots tend to be up in the White Mountains. And this is because back in the 1800s, late 1800s, when the railroads were running, 
that was an easy place to get to for people from Boston and Philadelphia. They could take the trains up. They could get up to, you know, the presidential range and then hike around and find all these northern species that they could not find where they were from. So it was like a, the fun thing for entomologists. Let's go to the White Mountains and look for northern dragonflies. And in fact, maybe a half dozen species were the first ones ever discovered were found in the White Mountains by people doing that. So anyway, back to what we're talking about. We started this project in 2007. The goals were to get better information distribution, get better, you know, think back to these big white spaces, get better data for other parts of the state. And also, and this talk is an outgrowth of number three, just increase public awareness about dragonfly stuff. And I have given this talk, I don't know how many dozen times at this point in the last 20 years. So it's my most famous talk. We did workshops all over the state. People learned how to catch dragonflies, how to identify dragonflies. Um, we set them loose. This is just a map of where people went in one year. That this year was a year we didn't really get north. Getting north is tricky because there aren't many people up there. So we ended up relying on little planned excursions. This is me and four hardy souls that went all over the Pinnacle Lakes to spend a weekend looking for dragonflies in Coas County because we just had limited coverage up there. So between all these regular volunteers on these little dragonfly bio blitzes essentially, we basically covered the state pretty well. Each of these little circles is a site with some data. The purple ones had lots of data, um, but either way, we got a lot of data. 1,200 sites, most of the towns in the state had some level of data. Just a little homage to the volunteers doing all sorts of crazy stuff. We actually, that girl in the upper right um, was part of a group of middle school kids that helped us collect exuvia on the Merrimack River um, and identify the species. The woman on the lower left lost her shoe in a wetland. <laughs> she found it, luckily. Um, so what did we find? There's a few slides here talking about some of the cool things we found, and this first one is out of date already since a month ago. This guy, the ringed bog hunter, is the only threatened or endangered species in the state. Um, if you look at the map there on the left, before we did the survey, it was found in six towns, maybe eight or nine places. Um, all of those towns are in the southeast, where there's a lot of development pressure, you know, potential degradation of wetlands. Um, but then we set people loose, and we basically doubled the number of places for that species. And this map actually has is missing a couple more that have been found since I last updated the slideshow. So as a result, at the end of the survey, we actually switched the bog hunter from endangered to threatened. It's actually better off than we thought it was, which is always a cool conservation success story. And we didn't actually do anything except look for them. And this guy is, as I said before, one of my favorites. Before 2001, it was not known to occur in the state. And then we found it in Moultonboro, Kingston and Amherst on that map in yellow, a couple more places since then. We let people loose and all those red towns where we found it during the survey. I kept looking and we found it in all those green towns in the last, you know, 10 years or so. And what's really cool about the species is if you talk to people 20 years ago, this was what was considered a coastal plain species endemic to the Northeast. It's actually only found from, at the time, New Jersey to Massachusetts. We found it in New Hampshire. Shortly afterwards, they found it in Maine. Three or four years ago, they found it in New Brunswick. It's obviously expanding its range north. It was considered a specialist of coastal plain ponds. Well, New Hampshire doesn't have a whole lot of coastal plain. And it definitely, somebody's drawing. <laughs> And it doesn't, and Berlin up here in the north is not in the coastal plain. So this species um, is just really cool. We went from no sites in 2000 and in 2001 to like 80 sites as of last year. And, you know, we just finished a big regional project with all the northeastern states to look at its range and the range of some other endemic species. And we're, it's just a fun, a fun, we've learned a lot about them in the last few years. Another species, a river species in this case, that single yellow town is Bosquin on the Merrimack River. This species was only known from an exuvia that someone found on the riverbank and collected, identified to that species. 
Um, the species itself, the pygmy snake tail, is very hard to find. The adults stay up in the trees when they're not feeding and mating, so you can't always find them. I've only seen that adult there and one more on the Saco in Conway. But we found exuvia all over the Merrimack and the Kentucook on the right-hand map. So again, a species that we thought was rare is far less rare when you just look for a different life stage, it's easier to find. And the final little story is the one about climate change. This is the eastern amber wing, a very small, um, bright orange little dragonfly, very common on ponds, that in 73 was only known from the southeast and barely known from the southeast. Um, by 2006 was found widespread in the lakes region, southeastern part of the state, a little bit of the Connecticut Valley, and we basically filled in most of the southern half of the state by now. So that species is slowly moving north and moving uphill, probably because of climate change and possibly also because of you know people making wetlands. Any little farm pond someone makes, the species will eventually find it and, and colonize it. So in, the, in this case, you know, most of these stories are suggesting that these dragonflies, in most cases, are fairly, you know, conservation-wise in good shape. There's a few species that are rare. The main threats that they face are habitat loss, um, you know, draining wetlands, polluting wetlands will affect some of the, the more specialized species, but in generally um, they're, they're fairly robust with respect to lots of other potential threats out there. And the fun thing about this map here is this shows what happened after we set, you know, 100 people loose just comparing 2006 and 2007, the number of towns with lots of species. It's very good coverage for the state. The purple towns, um, if you've forgotten the key from way back, are 75 or more species. The purple towns with an asterisk in them are over 100, and that needs to be updated as well. And you know the fun part of that, so that's 100 species out of 165. Concrete is 113, 114, I think, which is more species than California has. And people go, what's so long? You know, California has got lots of biologists, lots of people looking. California and the West in general are very low diversity compared to the Northeast, largely because um, the, there's less water in the West. The West is very dry, there's fewer wetland type habitats. So there's less diversity of habitat and therefore lower diversities of dragonflies. So that's a really cool message that, you know, the Northeast is actually a hotbed of ordinate diversity in, in North America. Um, I do like those little splotches, whoever was playing with those. It's like smushed dragonflies or something. So, you know, this thing ended up, ended um, nine years ago. The scary thought is that, you know, within another 10 or 20 years, we're going to want to redo it and see what's changing. You know, how many more species have moved in? How many species are declined? Have they expanded? And um, it's just a, you know, it's a really fun thing. They're really fascinating insects. We'll close it with the, another damsel and dragon picture that I added a net to, <laughs> that I otherwise stole from the internet. Um, and at that point, we can open it back up to questions and bad jokes, if anybody has any. All right. Thank you, Pam. You're uh, very welcome. There was, an, uh, um, and, you know, as I said before, folks can, um, you know, just like before they can unmute um, themselves to ask questions. But there was one question that came in um, during, I think, the second part of your oh. talk. And Dexter, you can, um, you can chime in if I get this wrong. But I believe, are you, when you're asking about the um, aquatic or, or nymph stage, was that of the first dragonfly that she mentioned that was migratory? Yeah, yeah, the one that was migratory. I, th I thought that was a big one, and so that it wouldn't. Oh, oh we got the church bells going off here. <laughs> uh, is it too much? Nope. No, you're good. I thought that the, the big dragonflies spent longer as nymphs underwater, but then I thought you said that the, um, that the darners, maybe they only spent the summer. Yeah, in that particular case, that species is one of those exceptions because they usually are breeding and living in really, really insect rich things. So think about these slimy ponds full of algae that's really warm. So warm temperatures and lots of food allow them to grow faster. And so that those ones actually can go through their whole life cycle really quickly within two or three months. 
be ready to migrate back south. And then they migrate back south. So yeah, this, that's most of, most of the big ones will take a full year. But of course, most of that growth occurs during the summer because during the winter, it's very cold and they're kind of chilling at the bottom, literally chilling. Sometimes they can freeze at the bottom of the ponds. I have an egg question, two egg questions. Yes. Um, so the, the ones that lay their eggs in the water, do you think it's possible when I'm swimming in a pond that I can feel, because I feel little things in the water. Do you think I could be feeling their eggs? Probably not. They're really tiny and really gelatinous. <laughs> it's probably just cooties or something. <laughs> the second one is, are there dragonflies that lay eggs like in a strand? Yes. Or is it there's, always singly? Okay. It's, there's one species, they're called basket tails, that, that have a big blob of eggs at the end of them, and then they will fly with the water, releasing them in a strand. But even then, once they land, they break apart and sink to the bottom separately. So it's just nothing like nothing stays in the strand. Other questions? I answered all of it? No way. Um, so I, I have a question um, about the dragonfly wings. So you mentioned the, was it the pseudostigmata at the ends of the wings? Mm -hmm. um, so assumedly that's different than some of, some of the species have just the diff pattern and coloration on the wings. Um, that is different, like the ones that have right. black dot, it looks like a black spots um, along it. Um, that's, that's different, but do, yes, like that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Now, I suspect, you know, I have to look into that. So it may be even denser pigment in that stigmata than on the other pigment. That, I'd have to look into that. So that's a cool counter question. But yeah, um, something about the stigmata is, pseudostigmata is, really the balance and it might be more complicated than just extra pigment. Mm -hmm. Jaina? Oh, so and then, oh, so the other question about um, color vision in dragonflies and what... They what definitely have it. Um, how it works is a good question. Um, vision in insects is very different from ours. I honestly don't know off the top of my head. Whether they've got ultraviolet vision, like a lot of like a lot of butterflies and bees do, um, that'll be a, yet another thing for me to try to remember to research before somebody asks me it by next time I give that talk. But they definitely have color vision, and it's you know it's obviously going to be different from ours. Thanks, Erin. I mean, we'll find everything in Canada. Um, oh, okay. So here is another. Here's a great question: um, Is there is, so there are lots of great apps for your phone uh, to help you identify various things. Are there any, because um, I know I was just talking actually with a, a neighbor of ours um, who works for the Forest Society and she was talking about like LEP, it was a Lepidoptera uh, app, but are there, are there any ones that you know of or recommend for dragonflies and damselflies? I remember hearing about one once, um, but honestly don't remember what it is. And of course I don't need them. <laughs> so I don't haven't researched that. And uh, yeah, I'm sure there must be, but what it is, I don't know. Um, but that's a good segue to another thing I was, I usually forget to mention. Somebody usually asks me about, you know, what kind of guides are there for these bugs? And the one I always recommend, um, it's still a, one of those old fashioned, you know, paper books. In fact, there's one sitting right here in my home office. Um, it's available um, directly from the um, Massachusetts Natural Heritage Program. It's called the Field Guide to the Dragonflies and Damselflies of Massachusetts. It has most of the species in New Hampshire, a few we don't have, and a few we have that are northern aren't in here. You can get it directly from the state of Massachusetts. Don't get it from Amazon because they charge you like $100 for it, which only cost you $20, including shipping. So if you actually want a really good book, you know, it's got lots of nice pictures and everything else. Um, it's an inexpensive and good starter field guide. There's also a Stokes Beginner's Guide to Dragonflies. Um, 
But if you look online, you know, there's a bunch of other ones. Okay. There's a Dragonflies of the East by Dennis Paulson, which is much more comprehensive and overwhelming if you haven't really got. So Massachusetts is the one to play with if you want to get a field guide. Okay, Pam, can you, do you mind typing the name of that field guide that you recommended into the chat feature? Oh yeah, that's a good day. I'll do it in the chat. I'll just that way that. people can, can see it. Um, the other, so another question that came through on the chat is if you're aware of any um, events coming up, any bio blitzes or citizen science, um, you know, efforts. I know a lot of things this year have been, you know, modified or, you know, truncated, but, you know, if you know of any events that, you know, that folks might be. The only one, I was supposed to lead a field trip on Sunday <laughs> in Romney, and that's been canceled. There was supposed to be a bio blitz down near Peterborough um, on Saturday. That's been canceled. Um, yeah, I don't think, I don't, I'm not aware of any other things right now. I know some volunteers of mine that are out there running around um, doing stuff. But yeah, right now, obviously, it's a pretty dry time of year for random, cool nature mm -hmm. events, unfortunately. Yes. All right. So thank you for putting putting the name in there. And Dexter, also, thank you, Dexter. It looks like put a link in as oh, well. Oh, yeah. Good job. I didn't even notice that. To the, yep. um, Perfect. Yeah. But that's for them. It supports it supports their program and is cheaper than getting it from Amazon. <laughs> both good, both good things. Both, uh, yes, both. Um, Someone mentions it's an Apple app. Yeah, I don't know how good any of these are. So, so in general, and I know, so I know that you know that Dexter and Lucy, who are on this, are you know are are questing right now and and working on their their dragon and damselfly, but. In, oh, you guys emailed me, didn't you? In a <laughs> <It's> normal... <laughs> it suddenly came to me. <laughs> Just that would very, um, um, yeah, but in a normal year, um, are there annual, um, you know, are there annual events, um, you know, and censuses that you know of regionally or? Um, not so many right now. It seems to have gotten um, a little slow. Obviously, when we were doing this project, we had all sorts of stuff going on, um, field trips and things like that. Occasionally, I do one. Um, so yeah, there's not, you know, it, it hasn't quite gotten to the state, okay, let's do a field trip of dragonflies. Like we'd have bird trips and things like that. You know, I've occasionally done one for Tin Mountain. Mm -hmm. um, there is the, um, what's it called? The guys in Maine, they have a bunch of workshop stuff that's more in depth. Um, you know, there's, there's an organization called the Dragonfly Society of the Americas people can join. Um, they usually have an annual meeting and a regional meeting every year. There's usually a regional meeting in the Northeast, which of course is not happening <laughs> this year. Um, but yeah, right now, unfortunately, especially since I've been doing more non Dragonfly stuff, there's not a lot of sort of public opportunities um, to do it. You know, I believe Dexter contacted me and I set him up with a friend of mine that still goes out a lot and hopefully that'll work out at some point. Um, so yeah, you know, when doubt get a hold of Tin Mountain, they can get a hold of me and maybe something will pop up. I can book you up with other people. But yeah. unfortunately, it's a bit of a self-taught field for the short term. And, and if people are interested in going out, um, you know, in, in terms of if they have a, a chunk of time, when both seasonally in the summer and time of day, um, do you think you would maximize diversity of what you would see? Yep. Um, seasonally, um, not much starts happening before mid-May. It peaks in mid-June, especially farther north and wraps up by the end of June, end, end of September. So July, August, and early September, or late June are the, are the busy months everywhere. There's a few species that go into November. We've had a couple of records just around Christmas on the seacoast for those little meadowhawks. Um, in time of day, um, it needs to be warm and clear usually because if it's not sunny, they often aren't flying because their food isn't flying. And so it's usually say nine or 10 in the morning through four o'clock or so in the afternoon is the best time. And ideally it's gotta be nice and sunny. 
And what I'm going to try to do, um, I might get out of full screen mode here for a second. Oh, that was going to screw something up, I'm sure. Um, we do have, if, if you were to go to Audubon's website and, and dig around, it's a pain in the butt to use it. Um, the report from our Dragonfly survey is on our website. If you dig around, eventually you might be able to find it. And that includes really fun things like range maps and maybe even more important, seasonal abundance charts, um, which can give you a rough idea of when different species are out. So some species are out different times of year, just like birds, just like wildflowers. If you're trying to find an ebony bog hunter, you're done now for the year. They're gonna be done in early July. If they start in late May, they're done now. So you have to like spread things out over multiple windows to capture the different diversities because some emerge earlier than others. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, late June to early September and uh, midday is the best time and get a good net, get a little hand lens, those are handy and you could go to town. Okay, fabulous. Um, I don't know if um, there's a question about still collecting data from volunteers. Yeah, um, I've got the chat up now too. So, sorry. <laughs> um, yes and no. There are a couple of hardcore folks, like I've mentioned before, that I'm hopefully getting Dexter in touch with, that are sending data in. Um, right now, we don't have an easy way of entering it. You know, I had a volunteer entering data before, so we now have like eight years of scattered data that I occasionally update some stuff with, but um, I won't dis I won't discourage you from doing it, but you know, you can still, if you send me stuff, there's two stages to this. One is QC, like, you know, half the time people don't know what they've got and I spend time identifying them, um, which is fun, but it's more fun when there's actually a good reason for it. Um, iNaturalist is a good, like the same person mentions, is a good way of collecting data in the interim. Um, there's people there that will help identify things for you as well. And then the data gets put into the bigger iNaturalist database. And at some point I can go into iNaturalist and dig up those data. So um, that's probably the easy short term thing for now. Of course, right now, you know, I don't have a good link to iNaturalist, but there's so many different things. There's also a place called Odonata Central, um, which is a Try and play only. I'm going to put the name here, um, which is a website maintained by a guy in Alabama that has, you know, nation Canada, U.S. wide data and other resources that might be a really fun place to, for people to check out, as well as a data repository that's a little, maybe a little more, um, you know, it's probably no different than that iNaturalist. They're trying to link them together when they can. Okay, well, great. Unless, um, unless folks have any other questions, which again, you can just, you know, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, if you have any questions for Pam. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for, you know, for giving us this. For your, was, I'm, I'm somewhat sad we didn't get the inaugural uh, Zoom program from you. But, well, but look, the cool news is I've I do just as well doing Zooms. I wasn't sure how it would work because I can't like interact with people and pick on them, but it seems to be working pretty well. Yes. Like, people yeah. enjoyed it. And nice to yeah. see you guys that are getting interested. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Good luck, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your summer. <laughs>